Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 511. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's June the 17th, 2019, the day after the Feast of the Holy Trinity. And welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get started, we need to explain your responsibility as the viewer. That's to share the program, and we want you to share it with everybody. And this is the cool thing. I see more and more on Facebook people sharing it in their timeline, and that means a lot to us. Comment on the episode that you see. If you go to our YouTube channel, click on the episode, you want to add a comment, correct us where we're wrong. That doesn't happen too often. Uh, be more concise about what we're right. That happens a lot. Uh, help us with some facts. That's great. And just keep the conversation rolling. We appreciate that. If you have not subscribed to the show, I don't mention this often, but you need to subscribe. The second you click that little button that says subscribe, you're going to get notifications of new episodes. And we have a podcast because, well, we're just that cool. Another cool thing is ACNA is having their 10th year anniversary. We just did GAFCON's 10th year, and it's kind of interesting to see, you know, one of GAFCON's biggest call was for a new province here in America. It happened. It stayed. It's here. They have a thousand churches now, and now they're kind of a mature province, just like GAFCON became mature. I thought we could talk about this before we talked about some more tidy topics. Are you impressed, George? Yes and no. Uh, I'm in. Pr- well, what do I mean by that? I mean that it's if if we believe that the creation of the ACNA is an act of the Holy Spirit, why should I be impressed? Because it was blessed by God. If we mean the creation of a successful, thriving human organization, yes, I'm impressed. Mm. But this was something that, you know, God's hand either was going to be behind it or <clears> it wasn't. So I'm very happy for them, excited for them, and I wish them well in their continued growth and prosperity. Am I surprised? Not really. No. Uh, Gafka, uh, Gafcon. Gavin, they said this couldn't be done. That if you make a Gafcon, it'll fall apart in five years. If you make a, uh, if you go out there and you're silly enough to make your own province here in America, it'll last six, five years tops, six years tops. This has got some staying power. I think it's hugely impressive from our from our point of view. I'm I'm often asked my people, a little somewhere behind the curve. Why aren't we doing what the Americans did? Why? Where is our English ACNA? Uh, why haven't people woken up to the fact this needs to be done and how could it be done? Uh, and the answer to that is, well, people are only very slowly waking up to it and still haven't worked out how it could be done. So I think from your point of view, even though you, you know, George's distinction about how and how not to be impressed is a proper one, um, there's a kind of holy envy uh, uh, looking at what the American Christians have achieved and saying this was the right thing to do at the right time uh, and perhaps even in the right way. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a huge achievement in the in the context of the cultural mess that we're in that is getting so much more intense and worse. The, the other thing, uh, right man at the right time. Hmm. Uh, the ACNA was blessed at its formation to have leaders like Bob Duncan, its first archbishop, uh, and were able to... The ACNA was not a one-size-fits-all organization. You had charismatics, evangelicals, Anglo-Catholics, Arminians, Wesleyans, uh, uh, Calvinists, and Bob Duncan was able to ride herd over what had historically been an unruly entity, because in the United States we've had these continuing Anglican churches breaking away, then splintering, then splintering, then splintering. Bob Duncan and the leaders of these disparate faith movements within the Anglican world hung, hung, hung together through thick and thin. Whereas the thing we see right now institutionally within what is trying to be formed in England is uh, tribalism and an extremist of we have been given the imprimatur of being top dog and unless you do it our way you cannot play in the game can we can we bounce from from this into a into a sort of more structured way of dealing with it we were uh, perhaps in the shadow of the holy trinity um 
uh, we were dealing in our in our conversation beforehand with two kinds of heresy and George you've been writing this week about prosperity gospel heresy and I've been uh, constantly concerned about something that I think is much more foundational which is the issue about human sexuality and, and anthropology and I want to make a distinction which I hope we'll do near the end of the show between if you like uh, local problematic heresies which I think prosperity gospel is in where you have a, a poor judgment in a poor person in a, in, in a, um, a badly judged officer of the church as opposed to something nuclear and foundational which I think the, the sexual and the cultural Marxist thing is but that's a way I think of, of offering it and why does this matter because we've just celebrated the Holy Trinity and when you that's get true. the Trinity wrong you and, you and if for example you introduce Arianism well the, the best example of Arianism is, is Islam um, and we could have a marvelous theological show on what happens when you get the theology of the Holy Trinity wrong so there are serious foundational heresies which will send the church spinning out of control and, and more local ones and George you were dealing with the local Kevin I'm taking over your role here I'm sorry, well, well, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> somebody should okay people don't know we're recording here a whole hour early it's not 8 a.m. it's 7 a.m. and we're just not you know not snappy we're gonna get there let's back up and set up the the story there is a bishop elect in Nigeria who's been accused of the press uh, preaching prosperity gospel clearly something that's in error in this Christian church by a prominent Anglican priest here in America. That's why the prosperity gospel is going to be topic today. Also, the Church of England is fully endorsing this transgenderism mm -hmm. uh, teaching in England, and it's going to be a topic we're going to talk about uh, as well because there's a lot in common here. One is a localized uh, bishop who's teaching in error, one is a province teaching in error. And I thought that's kind of the best way to set it up because here we used to have a single bishop a long time ago, late 60s and 70s, who taught in error, who was allowed to continue, and we just see the fall of the Episcopal Church. It only takes a spark, George. Yes, uh, I think what Kevin is referring to, of course, is the Bishop Pike, where uh, we had the introduction of false teachings, and Bishop Pike just really went out there. He even got into reincarnation towards the end. Um, and the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church agreed that he was a nutter, but wouldn't do anything about it because it just, you know, we're a boys' club, we're gentlemen, he's one of us. and He's our nutter, you know, yeah. He's our nutter, and frankly, we all know he's a nut job, and we don't really need to make this a public scandal. Well, when you don't, when you don't uh, seek to contain cancer, it spreads. And we've had different heresies over the last few generations, and the one that has arisen now is actually an American heresy, the prosperity gospel that arose out of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, people like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Benny Hinn, uh, the Jim Crouches, and yeah. so, so Jim and Tammy Faye Bakers, uh, Joyce Meyer, uh, people on the radio and TV that went to Africa and it's not really made its way into the ACNA or the uh, Episcopal Church but it made its way to Africa and has come in in a vengeance into the Church of Nigeria and some Nigerian trained and educated clergy have come to the United States and they're part of the Diocese of the Trinity of the Church of Nigeria and one of these people has is a down-the-line prosperity gospel preacher, meaning Jesus wants you to, if you Jesus wants you to be rich, the, the uh, object of faith is your temporal success in this life, and that why are you not healing the deaf? Why are you not raising the dead? Why are you not doing all these things that Jesus promised you could do if you had the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit behind you? Now this is a false and utterly and this let's see, the Church of Nigeria. Uh, as part of GAFCON, condemned this at the Jerusalem conference last year. Lambeth, 1998, condemned it. The 10, 15 years, when I was in Nigeria in the late 90s, this was considered f forbidden territory. But in the rapid expansion of the Church of Nigeria, they let some bad clergy flourish. This was not stepped on. And now we have somebody who doesn't even recognize that this is a problem about to become a bishop. And Matt Kennedy, 
a senior ACNA clergy uh, clergyman has uh, basically raised this issue of the Church of Nigeria is about to endorse heresy in the consecration of a false teacher as bishop. Kind of strange, huh? I mean, no, it's uh, it's not strange. I mean, we but in other words, it, it's the Bishop Pike route. It's the Bishop. It's the Gene Robinson route. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure he's a lovely man. I'm sure he, uh, you know, has all these things. But he's a false teacher. But the Church of Nigeria. But uh, some people. And it's funny. Um, I've been getting extraordinary amount of hate mail about this from. Um, and as well as support, and it's equally, almost equally divided. There's some Nigerians who are writing to me saying, yes, this is a terrible problem in our church on the lower levels with clergy and some bishops who are accommodating themselves to the Pentecostal culture that is so successful right now in Africa. They're trying to catch the wave and are teaching these false things. And then I have Nigerian Anglicans who write to me and say, what he's saying is absolutely normal. How dare you deny the power of God? How dare you say that this teaching is false? Can I can I take this important heresy, which you're, you're countering, and it's, it's very impressive in the way in which Anglican has been able to do that, and the discussion you set up, George, but do you use it to examine another question, which is very current where, where we are? And... Uh, uh, and I suppose has been current in the sense that it lies behind the foundation of ACNA. And that is the question of when can you fight, when can you, what is the nature of a heresy in a church that you can stay and fight it? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I guess prosperity gospel is something where you say, <clears throat> I'm not having this take over my church. I'm staying in here. Let's get rid of this thing. Let's examine it. Uh, look at its shortcomings. See perhaps what it was intended to be as a, as a blessing as opposed to a perversion. And then the situation when a heresy so takes over a church, you, you can no longer stay within it. Because that's one of the questions that people are asking in the UK. I heard a very good podcast by a conservative evangelical theology lecturer look at the last 150 years of issues and say, well, is what we're dealing with now one more of those? My position that I've been trying to, to, to suggest to people, obviously I think I'm right, but you have to test these things in public. It's, it's, it's a difference between living in a block of flats where your, your neighbor is, is noisy and unpleasant, smelly and noisy, perhaps. And you say, this, we cannot live with a neighbor like this. This makes our shared tenancy of this building impossible. Uh, and so whether it's John Robinson or, or, Je or Je Jack Spong or, or, or Pike, um, they'll be gone. They die and they go. And a better neighbor comes in and takes over that particular office. They, they're time limited by their mortality. But just, Gavin, uh, just you need a footnote. People will not know who John Robinson is, and you'll think that, that you mis you misidentified Gene Robinson, J. A. T. Robinson, Bishop John yes. Robinson of Woolwich was the God is dead man in the '60s. Is mm -hmm. that right? Is that who That's you're? Right, yeah. Okay, in, indeed it is. Thank George. Thank you. That's very helpful. People will indeed assume I'm ignorant instead of obscure. So <laughs> thank you for sorting that out for us. So, but the, the, there's always a possibility, if you take the building analogy, that instead of having a bad neighbor in a room uh, who will die or get moved on, uh, you, you may have a group of people who want to build an underground swimming pool and start doing it uh, and dig away at the foundations, so, uh, do it so incompetently that the building may collapse. And that's one of the reasons why the situation with cultural Marxism and the problem of gender identity is of a wholly different order from, I think, either the prosperity gospel or even John Robinson, uh, whom I knew six months before he died. And I said, John, why did you write this book? And he said, oh, I was just experimenting. Uh, six months later, he was dead and he, he went to, to explain it to Jesus. But, it, but it, it was a heresy you could stay in the church and fight and should stay in and fight. The problem we have now is that by confusing, by, by endorsing this whole new anthropology of sexual identity, we've taken in a Trojan horse that, will, that simply blows up Revelation. So we have women bishops saying you can no longer talk to the father uh, in liturgy because this is a problem when the Holy Spirit gets us to call out Abba. Uh, you have uh, you have people pushing the whole LGBTQ uh, experience as a matter of human rights and preserving a victimology. Um, there's a guy called Joseph Watson who's a very powerful YouTuber and he's 
in the last couple of days put up a YouTube showing that the trajectory of the LGBTQ movement that so many of our clergy, and women clergy in particular, are pushing as human rights, has moved on to zoophilia and paedophilia. Zoophilia, I won't explain to you. Not at this time of the morning. Google it. <laughs> <laughs> and paedophilia, we've always been saying that if you insist on an anthropology that says, I'm a victim of my sexual desire and sexual identity, and I'm entitled to, to, to exchange love, it will, in the end, act as a platform for, for children. Now, the, the problem we have at the moment is, if you build in this DNA change into the episcopate, so that by confusing the roles between men and women institutionally, you then open the doors to a whole spectrum of sexual identity politics. What what you end up with is a Christianity that, um, the, the, and the, the, for which there is no break for. So poor John Parker, we talked about in the last few days, said, effectively, I'm complaining the Bishop of Chelmsford said, either accept our policy of having mermaids teach infants about transgenderism or get out. And then the Bishop of Chelmsford said, I never used those words. <laughs> and of course, he, of course he didn't. He's a sophisticated communicator. But other people, apart from John Parker, have now stood up and said, you know, we heard him, we, we heard the message. In the, other inference, the inference, the yes. inference. The inference. And the inference, but, and, and the problem we have here is that one of the reasons why you can't fight it within a, a church like the Church of England is the inference is you either buy into this without any limitation on where it ends up, zoophilia, paedophilia, uh, what Camille Paglia calls a, a whole anarchy of identity, uh, or else you leave. And, and so this isn't something you can, in, to my, in my view, once it gets brought in through the episcopate, that allows the church to claim it has integrity to be an orthodox clerical entity. One of the difficulties, if I may jump in, Kevin, yeah, yeah. One, one of the difficulties is, is that this is not amenable to a political solution, meaning a negotiated settlement of differing sides. Uh, we had uh, a minor news item arise uh, the, in the, the cathedral in Wakefield in England. Uh, began omitting the name of the celebrant at the services because some people who are opposed to women priests, uh, if they knew a woman was celebrating at the Eucharist, they wouldn't come. And a complaint was filed because the Church of England, as an accommodation, as a settlement between those for and against women priests, said, we will do our best to accommodate both sides. Well, Wakefield accused, refused to do this. And a commission was set up, and they were found guilty of refusing to do this. And the dean of the cathedral says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. If you want to know who's going to be a woman, who, if we're going to have a woman celebrant, you have to make an appointment with me. You have to be a regular member of the cathedral. And if I want to see you, you can come and I will tell you, but you may not tell anybody else. And that's considered an accommodation. And here's the joke. Forward in Faith UK said, that's a good start. That's, oh my gosh. Thank goodness Ford and Faith is in that corner there. I mean, boy, they're really doing great work. I'm being sarcastic for those yeah. who don't know my humor. Uh, well, but he, in other words, you cannot, and you know, they, and we have the even larger, uh, tell me, Gavin, how many uh, conservative evangelical bishops or deans or archdeacons have been appointed in the last 20 no. years? Well, of course, of course, none. And this is the whole nonsense of, of mutual flourishing, which was a foundation upon which uh, particularly Catholic Anglicans were supposed to believe they could stay faithfully in the church. The problem with what the dean, is worse than you said, George. What the dean is inviting people to do is to come and explain their theological reasons for finding the ministry of a woman as a priest unacceptable. Well, he's basically saying, let me bully you <laughs> because I'm going to try and explain to you why you're wrong. I mean, so so any any worshiper who wants to receive the Eucharist at the hands of a, of a male priest, as was always the case for 2000 years, now has to enter some form of interrogation. Do you know, something Something terrible happened to me the other day. I, I Just to lighten it up, I, I, I wanted to sing in a, I was invited to sing in a choir um, uh, locally, and uh, they said, we, we need you, come along. And I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And then I got this letter saying, you're quite well known on the internet, so we've got a couple of questions for you. I said, fine. Uh, they said, well, our treasurer is is a woman Anglican priest. And our conductor is, is in a gay marriage. Would you feel comfortable 
So I wrote back, because I, I, I can be slow sometimes. So I wrote back saying, well, so long as so long as in the middle of a choir rehearsal, she doesn't attempt to get behind the altar and offer me Jesus in the sacrament, I'd, I, I'd love her to be your treasurer. And I look forward to having tea and meeting in my nice sister in Christ. And as, as for your, your conductor being in a gay marriage, most of the conductors I've ever known, especially the good ones, have been immensely gay and very friendly towards other gay people. So I'd be coming for his musical skills, not, not his sexual and romantic ones. Um, and I thought, I thought that was a clever letter. And then I realized they weren't asking me if I was, if I was comfortable at all. What they were saying was, to join our choir, you have to accommodate yourself to our particular cultural milieu. And if you can't do that, you can't sing. It was very gentle. It's only at the beginning of the process. But it's another example of the way in which, not only inside the church, but outside the church, uh, a, a complete change of culture has taken place. There's a, just very quickly, you may have seen it, there's a video going in the rounds where a 17-year-old boy in a Scottish school is being thrown out of the classroom by a teacher because the boy says, science says there are two genders. And the teacher, a large threatening man in his 50s, says, we have an inclusive and diverse policy at this school. We don't believe that. Now, uh, um, uh, Adrian uh, Hilton has just... Uh, legitimize this video and a theological comment on it on um, on Cranmer, but it, it gives an example of the of the enormously serious problems we have, and, and we're back to the question of when can the church accommodate itself to a local culture without tearing its guts out and becoming something different? Well, I, I would I would like to propose the biggest error the church makes in this, and that's to when they make a decision, right or wrong, they always leave the door open. Oh, I know where this is going. Go on, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Go on. <laughs> we just saw this, the, the women in the Episcopate report from the GAFCON. And good report, well studied, everybody agreed at the end. And then the last sentence is, by the way, if, thing, if these things change, we'll revisit this. And I, 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 did they do that the, the, with the Nicene Creed, where all these bishops walking away from the Nicene Council going, you know, if things change, we're going to go back and revisit the, the Nicene Creed. No, you, you don't leave the door open. Uh, God is about our yeses and noes and willing to make the hard noes and willing to make the hard yeses. And but, 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 of course, Kevin, what you're saying is it, it's a complete confusion. of It's a category confusion. Mm -hmm. What is the change they're looking for? The answer is if our culture changes, we might come back to that's, it. I guess but, that's what happened. We're really, but what you're saying is, mm -hmm. Actually, the way we conduct our church is not about the variations of culture. Just ask the Eastern Orthodox. They're very good on this. There is an apostolic, there is an apostolic structural revelation which has kept the church in place. If you change that because of local circumstances, you run the risk of destroying the church, which is what the progressives are, are in the middle of doing. Mm -hmm. Leave the door open. Yeah, bad well, let, let, no, let, 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 me, uh, let me put my thumb on the other edge of the scale. I, I, right. I think we're, because I happen to, well, I happen to know the, the two people involved in the conversation, <laughs> Kevin Colson and Stephen Knoll. Um, I think that uh, should the church of one mind, the Catholic church, it, it's, it's how we have the development of doctrine over the course of centuries. In other words, the church at the, the, the creeds and the whole church ethos and theology did not begin on the day of Pentecost. It was a series over the course of history and time, but it was universally received as being a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what I think they're, they're saying is not that we're going to, as soon as we get to 50% plus one in an ACNA, we're going to change, but rather if we see a similar movement of the Holy Spirit, so that we can move in step with our Catholic and Orthodox brothers on these points. I, I, okay, I, that, that, would be, that would be my understanding. Let, let's have a fight about this. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they just did in the Church of England over sexuality. Well, no, 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 I mean, but, George, you're, but, not, you're not wrong in principle. In one sense, you, you, of course you're not wrong in principle. Nothing you said is mistaken there. But, but, but we need to put it in context. So one of the things I think I would say is that the, how long did the promise of Jesus that the Spirit will lead you into all truth last? Um, I guess this, you know, let's have a discussion. I don't know the answer, but I would say about 500 years. 
I would think if, if within the first 500 years, the apostolic foundations of the church hadn't, hadn't grown and developed, and I think that the, the three things I'm thinking of would be Eucharistic theology, the structure of the ministries of the church, uh, and, and I had a third thing in mind. Oh, the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit. To my mind, those are perhaps three of the absolutely arteries down which the life of the church follows, flows. Well, let, let's give let's give the Holy Spirit 500 years. Well, if that's not long enough, he can have another 500. Let's go to the year 1000. But if after the year 1000, knowing that heresies repeat themselves ad nauseam, in other words, we you know one of the things we know about is that the heresies just keep on coming back in a slightly different form. My problem with the women in the Episcopate thing is that for 2000 years, this never peaks its nose above the surface, apart from maybe the, the exciting women prophets in Montanism, um, and you know that's that's always seemed to me to be the most fertile place for asking if the Holy Spirit had led the Church into a new understanding of gender. But the problem I have with what Stephen Knowles said was, there's been no indication in two thousand years that a comment that, that the particular insights that this secular society are giving the Church are ones that peaked up before and we should have taken notice of. On the contrary, when we trace the effects of them, they lead to zoophilia. And I'm, I know that's a very offensive thing to say, but that seems to me to be unequivocally how the dots join up. Well, I, as I say, I, I, I'm, take, I'm taking a high-minded view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking a high-minded view because I do not think that the uh, task force on women's episcopate is... Uh, is laying the groundwork for zoophilia in the. <laughs> I, did lay myself laid back. I, I don't think that's on their agenda. Uh, but we're, 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 I, I, I do think, in other words, um, perhaps I don't place them in such. A high, just as we are having these arguments over the uh, filioque clause, uh, do we, the dual or single procession of the uh, the spirit, um, the, should we drop? Uh, should we make our uh, Nicene Creed in line with the Orthodox, or should we follow it along with the Catholics, uh, where, where we've always done? If we follow it along with the Cath, if we go along with the Orthodox, then those who are who are of a Karl Bartian mindset will say we're no longer Christian. Um, do I follow that line of thinking? No, not particularly. Uh, but I'm not really ready to say in my own heart that. Uh, uh, I know the answer that this is, you know, it's settled and it's done. So you're, I think you're a phenomenal debater, and I and I'd love to sit down and have another hour uh, looking at whether or not the hierarchical view um, of the Trinity that the filioque undermines preserves the Church from the attack on the fatherhood of God in a way that the Western Church hasn't managed. I love the idea that the imposition of the filioque has left a little breach in our theological Trinitarian wall. But, but, but this is... But, but, but I, I, Gavin, I think the deeper point that I'm trying to make is not theological, perhaps it's political. And it's that I think in these difficult times, perhaps it's better to assume the best than the worst in dealing on these issues because they're not going to be finalized and allows us more wiggle room to get people on board if they don't feel they're being attacked immediately. And so in other words, if you have somebody, uh, I've seen people switch sides on the women's uh, priests issue, but if you counter it off, if you begin it by harsh, unambiguous language that basically denigrates the person rather than the idea, you, that's as, as, as they hear it. I, I think we, I, I don't think that's a wise way forward. So I, I'm not arguing against the principles you arise. George, if, I think I, if we, that's the approach this differently. Uh, okay, well, hold on. The, my original premise, although not fully caffeinated, uh, was that <laughs> the conversation is never set up to end. And Daba continues forever. We're leaving the door open if things change. And it, it's not so much of how this is introduced, but how this top, a topic or a heresy or a big theological discussion within the church is ended. When do we finally say, this is this, not that, yeah, rather than it, it, the introduction? And I see that with some of these re later reports, especially Anglican-wide, you know, we're always leaving the door open for other options. 
uh, other discussions, more in Daba type things. Well, if we believe, well, if we believe there's an end point in history, of course, then all these discussions must be kept open. Hmm. But if we believe in a circular or, or cyclical worldview, then of course you've got to stop. But if we believe that there is an end point to all this, which I believe is the return in Jesus Christ to this earth, until such time, nothing uh, can be said to be fully closed. Well, no, George, that's not true. I mean, for, <laughs> and some, <laughs> lovely. but 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 I, you know, I I hold I hold you accountable for preferring process over principle. Uh, the, the the Holy Trinity, for example, it's closed. The, the 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 Trinity, our understanding of it, problematic though it is, because we're so flawed. Um, we accept the apostolic and the creedal witness of the church. If someone came along, if the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses came along and said, "Ah, oh, but look, George, George is right." Um, we can go on discussing the nature of the Trinity. You Christians have not got it sorted out. There's a difference between our failing to understand. No, but see, Gavin, then you just conceded. Uh, there's a difference between discussing it and then your second half, which it's not been sorted out. The absence of the discussion does not mean uh, that one gives up on an idea or a principle. George, that's a beautiful way of winning an argument, and you've won it on that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> some of my favorite classes are you know, discussing the nature of gravity, even though you're, who's going to argue with gravity? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but George, in the terms of the argument you set up, you won it. That's true. <laughs> no, I, that's that's not fair, Gavin. Um, no, no, I'm agreeing with you. Goodness me, I'm being, I thought I was being generous. <laughs> no, There's think, no irony there. No, I, I think, because I think... I, I think you're hearing me say something more strongly than I perhaps mean it to be said, and I'm hearing it perhaps more strongly than you're meaning to be said. But what I, where I'm, as you're right, I'm more uh, process oriented than uh, perhaps principle oriented, and that does not speak to a lack of firmness or character or intellectual rigor. It speaks to an understanding of what the whole point and purpose is, which is preparing the world for the return of Jesus Christ. And I don't know when that's going to be. And and I, I all we're arguing about, about, I think, is what does it mean to discuss? So yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. We but, should. Well, uh, here's the funny thing. You know, you guys have been doing this for five minutes, and you're both right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with Kevin. All three of us are right. My daughter is driving out to Montana to a new job this week, and we're discussing how much money she wants. Uh, no, no. The answer is she's not getting anything. But we're still discussing. She can it. discuss it. Give, discuss and you will it, even give her hope. Anything. You no, will give her a little hope. You know, discussing. I, we seek to educate, not to to uh, to bully. Hmm. George, that's a perfect note to finish on. Yes, it is, <laughs> gentlemen. I do pray you have a wonderful week, Gavin. You were out there you're four or five hours ahead of us what time is it there now i'm uh, my it's lunchtime <laughs> ah, so you go that explains the hurry i got it, i got it so do have a wonderful week george i pray your daughters have safe travels we become empty nesters today at 5 40 benjamin flies off to college a new era i should have something soap opera music in the background i'm kevin colson i'm george conger I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been taking a seminar in how to discuss things in Anglican Unscripted 511 on the 17th of June 2019.